Okay, excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, Akil. Thanks very much for the uh, introduction. Um, so, uh, my name is Liam Forlorn. Um, I spent about 15 years in the University of St Andrews in Scotland before returning to Cork in, tw in 2016. Um, I still have an affiliation with, 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 with um, the University of St Andrews, uh, and I'm working at the Centre for Advanced Photonics and Process Analysis, which is labs both in Cork Institute of Technology and the Tyndall National Institute. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving some perspectives on the field of integrated photonics and semiconductor lasers, uh, looking in particular at data communications and optical spectroscopy. Um, as you, I'm sure you're well aware, this is quite a huge field, so uh, I'm not going to try and give a, an overview of everything, um, but I'll be focusing in on a, a few of the key opportunities uh, as, as I see them. Uh, the first question you might have is, is um, what is the connection between data plans and optical sensing, um, as, as, as there is in the uh, title of my talk? Uh, the two fields sound very different. Um, and indeed, the application areas are completely, uh, completely separate. However, there is a clear connection between the two, um, and you'll find that many of the research groups in this field um, have both uh, have had activities in both sensing and communications. And perhaps, perhaps the following is a, is, a, is a very quick explanation of what this link is. So in general, whenever you build an optical sensor, you're looking to, um, to something will change in your system that changes the light intensity. Normally it's an absorption. That's read off in a photodiode or similar and you change a voltage. Uh, and this gives you a measure for what has happened in your system. Um, in data communications, it's kind of the opposite. It's the, the same function but reversed. In data communications, let's say an optical modulator, you would like you apply a voltage to the to the to the to the, to the sample, uh, and this either changes the absorption or the interference, and this changes the light intensity, creating the ones and zeros that, um, that transmit the data. So, in terms of the physics, there is a well, the same process, just flipped in many senses. In data communications, I like to consider you're, you're you're sensing the material, you're sensing your refractive index change or similar that's created by the by the applied voltage. Um, and, and, and as, as suggested, as I mentioned, the underlying physics is, is, has clear connections in both, very similar in, in, or, similar or identical in some cases, uh, and very often we use the same, same devices, same fabrication processes, that creates a, a clear synergy between the two fields. So my talk will be connected, will be broken up into two sections. The first will be on data communications, the second on optical sensing and spectro particularly in spectroscopy. So um, this talk follows on, will follow on quite nicely, I hope, from uh, Andrew Ellis's talk on Monday. Andrew gave a, a very good overview in the field. Uh, and basically, I'm just going to reinforce in, uh, some of the points he made uh, and look at a few um, specific, specific uh, application areas and opportunities. I'll take a slightly more device perspective, whereas Andrew was uh, looking at it from more the, the systems point of view. Uh, on the optical sensing side, I will focus in on spectroscopy and we'll look at see how various semiconductor la lasers uh, and techniques are, um, are, 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 are leading to enhanced and improved spectroscopy uh, and how this impacts on applications. Right, so... Um, as many of us are aware, there is a huge, huge growth in the field of data centers and pretty much everything we do on the internet is connected to a data center in some way. And there's a nice quote there. Um, basically, whenever you see something with smart in the title, there is, that device is connected to a data center in some ways. Um, the data centers currently consume about 2% of the world's, uh, uh, world's electricity which is projected to be 8% by 2030. Um, quite clearly, you need, to be slightly, you need to be cautious about those projections. I remember in 2014, I think there was various reports that said the data center electricity is, was, was actually at 2% at that stage and projected to grow, uh, grow rapidly, which clearly hasn't happened over the last six years or so. Um, and actually, this, this, this harks back to Andrew's talk. The reason that growth, that growth in, 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 uh, in data center electricity con consumption 
is due to the improvements that we that, that the, the field has made in the devices, how obsolete devices have been uh, phased out and replaced and so on. Um, and now it feels as though we're back to uh, well, the, the demand is certainly going to grow over the over the um, over over the coming years. And we have the same challenge. The field has the same challenge as to keep improving, to keep that electricity, um, or to keep that power consumption where it is now, um, ideally where it is now. Um, and just to give a little bit of local flavour, so in Ireland, the, there is roughly 10 data centres are under construction, and that projection is even more extreme in Ireland's case. Uh, and I say our risks of hitting that 29 are quite a bit higher than the world is of hitting eight. The Irish government is far too effective in tempting big multinationals over here, uh, which uh, Ireland is also quite proud of its climate change goals and similar. So the two are uh, diametrically opposed if you look at the details. Right. Okay. So, um, as I'm sure we're all well aware, um, optical fiber optics has been replacing uh, electrical cables at a ever increasing pace. The um, and the reason for that basically, it basically comes down to capacitance. Whenever you have an electrical communication, you must charge the wire to the operation voltage. And in general, for, for um, once you've got any sort of significant length, that, cap that, that capacitance of that wire will dominate. So typically in electronics, on the ends, these little blue boxes I have, have here, um, there tend to be transistors, they tend to be quite low capacitance components. And this wire, I think that number of um, that, that two peak for, for per centimeter number is quite a good one. And it's quite hard to beat. Um, so very quickly, you guys are getting very significant um, capacitances building up. Um, optical fiber, optical fibers, basically the, the bit in between the devices comes for free. The fiber itself has no capacitance. And it is the, 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 the capacitance of the device at the terminals that dominates. Um, and this has impacts both on the speed, which is given by the RC concept constant, and the power consumption, which is given by half CV squared. Um, so the capacitance will come in in two places, on the energy per bit, and on the, um, on the RC time constant. Um, so here we see the uh, similar, similar little, uh, little sketch. Um, and um, but this, this, this creates kind of trade-off beyond a, beyond a certain length. The um, for long lengths, it is the link capacitance that dominates. Optics will tend to be more efficient. For very short lengths, it is the terminal capacitance that will dominate, uh, which makes electronics favored <coughs> um, for, for very short reach lengths. That switch over, at which point optics is more efficient or faster or more efficient in electronics, has been occurring at a, a shorter and shorter length over time. And it now appears to be roughly the, the tens of meters um, scenario. Um, and probably unlikely that this will, or it's likely to improve, but unlikely to reach down actually into the millimeters um, length required for um, big impact on the CPU itself. But anywhere we're looking to connect, um, connect uh, CPUs and computers to one another, you could well expect optics to be the, the favorite solution um, given enough time. So the uh, optical cables are therefore a key, compo a key component in making data, center work, data centers work. On the top right here, I have a picture from 2012 of uh, an IBM supercomputer. Um, and we can see, well, we can see, you can see that the, um, we can see, we can see that over time, both the layout and structure of these data centers and supercomputers have gotten far more efficient, and they've started structuring the, um, the, the infrastructure so as to hold the fibers in a more efficient way. Um, in a nutshell, basically fibers everywhere. Uh, it is key that we connect. Um, is key that all well, basically to in order in order for um, queries at the data center to work properly, there needs to be fiber at all levels. Um, and the, the modern modern as you see the modern data centers are, are custom built around the fiber infrastructure to allow it to be housed and connected 
they are getting quite large. So many of the links now are up to kilometers from one side of the data centers to the other, making single mode fiber and similar the preferred solution. Um, here we see a few of the, the um, different links and, uh, required by the data center at the connect from one data center to another or to the outside network. There tends to be high bandwidth links with um, wide use of WDM, DWDM or sorry, dense wavelength division multiplexing and coherent technologies and quite high bit rates. Um, inside the data center itself, there is up to our sub, sub five kilometer links between pods or sections of the data center. Um, and as we're shorter, the bit rates will tend to be decreasing um, um, with, with a but the volume of links is clearly increasing as the number of cores, uh, the number of connections that need to be made increase. Uh, with maybe going down to pixel-based links uh, for, for, for a few meter lengths inside the rack itself. Um, <clears throat> a couple of points to note is, as I mentioned, the shorter link, the higher, larger the volume of, 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 of connections needed. Um, and as you go, uh, bit rates drop. You can to have a fewer and a smaller use of WDM and a greater use of multiple of uh, multiple fiber lanes uh, and similar as we go along, which is mainly a cost argument and it's a point I will return to in a few slides time. <clears throat> now, well, clearly the optics is a key is a key has a key functionality in making the data center work in order to allow all these cores to. to talk to one another and communicate effectively. But does the actual optics have an impact on the overall power budget? Um, and as a, as a fraction of the, as a whole, the, the network is, is not a large value, somewhere in the three, three percent is a number I've seen in some places with 10 on the higher end of the, higher end of the range. Um, so it seems that the photonics itself does not have a huge impact on this 2% of electricity that the, that the, that the system just consume. However, there are a few, there are a few, there's a, there's, a, there's, a big op, there's a key opportunity here, which is in that basically the current data center architectures are not tremendously efficient. Um, and this is the reason is say, let's say um, is the, the racks and computing facilities of the, of, the, of the data center tend to be handed out in, in lumps, each which is, uh, has a fixed set of computing, memory and storage solutions. Um, so let's say if a company is renting renting uh, renting capacity in the data center, they'll tend to rent a complete complete pod, let's say, uh, which has a fixed set of computing, memory, and storage or resources, with not a whole lot, um, no, no, not a, not a whole lot to spare. So basically, it's a, a one size fits all solution, which does not necessarily serve the customer that well. Um, which means that um, not all that capacity is is used effectively. And there's a number number there of 40, 40 to 50 percent of capacity is currently wasted because the, the layout or the distribution between computing memory and so on is not appropriate for the for the for task at hand. Uh, and indeed, apparently, this number of 40 to 50 percent of wasted capacity was much worse five ten years ago. Um, equally, we have the other problem that many users of data centers will make sure they have spare capacity to deal with surges in demand. Um, that's a very recent example, um, and whereas it's slightly embarrassing for Walmart, but let's say if this was a government uh, service or a bank, it is hugely embarrassing, uh, and we can expect um, quite quite a sizable amount of capacity being wasted in servers who are just sitting there, switched on, just waiting for that for that for that for that surge in demand. Um, so <clears throat> this is triggering um, uh, new uh, research. into new articles and designs as a concept. Um, and the, the problem to be overcome is what's known as this single box server, in which the server has a has this um, predetermined ratio of processing power to memory to IO to input and output. So for example, if you give your um, your if you have a task that is process intensive, 
your CPOs can be working at say 100% capacity, but the input output could be, it's just sitting there doing nothing. Um, equally, if you have a, a task that where the bottleneck is input output, you won't be using your, you won't be utilizing your CPUs properly. Uh, and this is a uh, unavoidable uh, problem with the conventional architectures. So there's been a paper by Ali et al. from um, published in 2017, which has created a, a bit of a stir in the field, which is the proposing uh, a pooling of resources. Uh, and by this means, this is this 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 this, this idea of rather than having a, a basically a server box, you have um, dedicated racks, dedicated processing processing um, the capacity dedicated memory, dedicated I.O. Uh, and then you connect those together at will for your task in hand, and therefore you can make a far more efficient usage of your, um, of the, of the resources available. So again, this is today's picture. Let's say a company rents that, that, that dark, that shaded rack. Now the idea, which is the, the current inefficient situation, if instead we want to split out all the functions that the company in question needs, and we have their accessing memory in one section of the data center, processing in another, and so on. Um, this gives that power savings, but next. This means you need far better optical connections between all, um, between all these components. And in general, it creates particular pressure on the switches um, on the, the switching uh, on, the, on the switching and routing of the connections throughout the data center, particularly you need to make those distributed um, um, distributed functions act as a single computer, which is um, which is basically a challenge that we will be basically that's being set for the, the field of photonics. So um, again. Key thing is latency that you need to connect one section to the other with the with the minimum with the minimum delay, um, and this um, basically um, requires a need to kind of basically flatten the topology of how the um, the different cores and components of the data center connect to another. So in the let's say conventional topology, let's say there's a four a four port system. Again, to make you need to hop across multiple um, switches and so on. If you want to connect to something on the other side, uh, to to another to another uh, resource somewhere else in the um, in the in in the <coughs> in the data center, and if as a as and if a, and if this the this aggregated server concept kicks on, you will need to make far more connections. So the latency in those switches or in this sort of factory topology will become pro prohibitive very very quickly. Um, so there needs to be a way of Flattening the topology using making more more effective and more efficient switches, which is a driver for will drive as we see will drive more WDM, will drive faster connections, faster and new types of switches. So here is a solution that's been proposed, uh, that's been studied in the ICT Streams project led by, led by Nikos Peros. Uh, in this case, the key, one of the key functions is what's known as a cyclic AWG. So you have a um, this is a, an eight port socket is what the, the work is what it works on, um, and each socket has a tunable laser and ring resonator, and by tuning the light from that socket goes to a cyclic AWG, and depending on the wavelength used by that socket, it will switch its output from one from the from 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 one output port to the other. So it's a very um, it's a passive wavelength routing um, uh, strategy. That um, gives very fast, efficient um, connections from one to the other. And in this case here, where isn't let's say conventional routing, you need to make multiple hops. Uh, here with the cyclic AWG, you get you can um, you can have a far more efficient, faster, flatter, um, uh, flatter topology. This can even be taken uh, a bit further, um, in which case using the, the Hippolaeus, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly, but uh, that's the uh, uh, design of Nikos and his team for a, an optical packet switch. Um, this gives a, um, this connects basically 
of the optical end of the of the multi socket board you've seen on the previous slide. This is now one of the nodes that feeds into this optical pack packet switch. The optical packet switch uh, adds in other functions such as optical delays, wavelength switches to resolve contention, um, contention um, and similar. Um, and this, um, well, this promises to give a, a very, very, um, very, very flat topology, which is giving, um, well, potentially a sub, sub microsecond latency for, for any connection between the different nodes in the in, in the network. Um, and it's this sort of technology is um, is, is required to, to realize the distributed um, distributed server concept. Um, and but clearly I think what we have here what we have proposed what's proposed so far is quite a bit beyond the current state of the art in optical connections. That's going to drive the, drive all of us to both develop new and improved lasers, modulators, and so on. So now let me delve into those into a little bit more detail. Um, so, for example, the modulator has always been a, a key um, a key function in, in an optical link. And here I'm just uh, showing some results from a re recent paper from Graham Reed's group in the University of Southampton. This case, I think, is one of the um, I would say very elegant design of a 100G plus optical modulator. Uh, and one of the key steps they've done is to actually design the optics and the electronics in tandem. Um, so um, so the, 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 the driver has been optimized to have a, um, an inductor in, um, in, the, in the top layers of the, of the CMOS chip itself. Um, <clears throat> which uh, gives an uh, inductive spiking, which uh, helps uh, the efficiency of the of the driving. The max sender then of the modulator is looped back in itself in order to facilitate the connection to the CMOS driver. Again, at, at these sort of speeds, you want to minimize the length of your metal traces as much as possible. Uh, and this this the 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 this is well, it's, 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 it's clearly important to um to design the max sender. To make the to to, to in, in this fashion, and again we have grating couplers as the uh, input and output for um, which is now one of the standard techniques. Um, and this gets very very. I think by, by my knowledge, that's one of the record le record levels of driver power consumption at these sort of speeds. And the other key point is this co-integration of the electronics on the on the silicon chip as close as possible to the modulator itself. Uh, is key. Um, again, as touched on previously, if you want to get that energy bit, the energy bit, bit down, we must reduce our, uh, our capacitance further. Uh, and one drawback of the max under modulator is they always tend to be about a millimeter or so in length, or indeed there's some sophisticated designs out there, but the basically the amount of carriers you suck in and out of the modulator tends to be the same, regardless of the um, configuration which translates into broadly similar capacitances um, and a, um, a relatively high energy per bit. If you want to scale it down further, resonant enhancement is one of the most promising routes. Uh, and this basically is using some sort of optical resonator. And here it's a, a fabri Perot, where um, the, optical length, the optical length of the resonator of the modulator has increased while keeping its um, physical or let's say the electrical properties remain the same. Um, and this can, this gives you potentially um, um, same sort of extinction ratios and so on without uh, while, while still having the, the capacitance of a very small component. Um, the ring resonator is a particular particularly popular route to, to, to employing this resonant enhancement. And here we see one of the early results which have been which have been improved many times um, or which basically trigger the field and loads of subsequent improvements. In this case here, we, we see a cross section where the PN junction is used to change the refractive index of the center region, which then shifts the resonance, uh, um, resonance back over. And here we can see the physical dimensions of the ring as being um, roughly uh, uh, a couple of orders, an order of magnitude or so smaller um, than the equivalent max zender. <coughs> so, 
And um, there's a wide range of resonator designs available. And um, that's a micro disc uh, approach. Again, the uh, literature has a uh, every every has their own favorite technology. Um, the key key aspect about ring resonators is they're also very they're WDM compatible. That you can have multiple wavelengths traveling in this bus wave by here, and the ring will only modulate one channel at a time, which makes the system uh, well intrinsically very scalable. Um, and here is another result from the ICT streams project uh, where they're using, which is basically one of the building blocks as part of their um, their, 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 their switching uh, their AWG based switch. Uh, in this case, they're using four very fast rings. Um, to to, uh, to um, in their WM system and getting down to femtojoule per bits, um, uh, or tens of femtojoule per bits, uh, switching energies. Um, key aspect of the uh, well, key, key key restriction of the ring resonator is the speed is always going to be limited by the photon lifetime. So getting speeds much in excess of this value does appear to be difficult. So if you're, um, which leaves the, if speed is everything, the, the max under modulator tends to be your um, tends to be preferred solution. Okay. Now let me return to the problem of the, the laser, which is one that never, never will never go away. Um, so, as your as um, wavelength division multiplexing is very widely used in telecommunications, but it is not so widely used in the data center. And uh, if you think back to that picture I showed at the very start, it tends to be data center to data center outside or links outside of the data center that sees heavy use of uh, WDM and DWDM. Um, the the problem itself isn't actually the laser. There there's um, the DFB lasers require performance, can be produced in volume uh, and at low cost. The issue is more about power consumption or the need to ter terribly stabilize this laser. So if we just have pulled some example spec sheets here for different WDM systems, um, and the need to, as the channel spacing gets tighter, as you need to control um, the, the key, uh, as, as, as the control required over the channel, over the channel increases, the power consumption of that channel, channel will, or that laser tends to increase very rapidly. Um, and the, um, which, which adds into both a power consumption problem and indeed into a, in a, into a, into a cost uh, as well. And the reason for this is basically, if you look at the, the, the lasers used in WDM systems, they're always, most of them are mounted in these little gold box system units uh, and invariably they're sitting on a thermometric cooler. And that thermal electric cooler is basically the, the cause of the problem. Um, it consumes, well, typically, most of them will consume about an amp per hour. And if every laser in your data center is sitting on one of those coolers, you have a, a big, big problem. Um, um, and the, the issue basically comes down to thermal stability of the laser. The uh, indium phosphide that makes up your the typical DFB has a has a significant term optical coefficient, which means that whenever the temperature changes, the, the refractive index will change and the lasing wavelength is going to change. And it also affects on, on the gain curve as well. Uh, and for that example here, if you have, if you simply change the temperature of the DFB by 60 degrees, so again, the data centers, it needs to meet the spec of working between, between 20 and 80 degrees, um, ideally more in fact, that 5.2 drift will basically kill pretty much any anything except for course WDM. Uh, and this is something of a fundamental problem. Uh, if you have one of these monolithic DFB lasers and you want to use it in a WDM system, you must have, you, you have to use temperature control. Um, fortunately, there are some new solutions emerging, which is um, what, is, what has been called as a uh, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid lasers which um, consist of a gain element provided by an indium phosphate K element, element coupled to a silicon phonics passive component. Um, and in some ways you can see this, 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 this goal of this, this particular subfield as taking the tabletop solid state lasers and start compress all the components down onto the silicon chip. 
And I think this picture here is we work from Oracle, where um, we have one of the was, was one of the first demonstrations, and you can start to see the kind of little complexity of components on that silicon chip, which is seeking to replicate um, the, the the toolkit of components available if you build a, a laser on an optical table. Um, and again, this gives, well, this is an important toolkit, you, or this is an important development. You now have more materials to work with. You could optimize each component for the task in hand rather than put in some sort of compromise. Um, um, and uh, here, actually, that's one of our results on a hybrid on a crystal laser down in the bottom right. So first of all, I'll just show one of our one of our own results here on how we can use the, um, the hybrid laser concept to deal with um, the, the, the the wavelength variations or to increase the thermal stability. So we have a, a laser of this style. We have a gain block, a new phosphor gain chip, coupled to a, a silicon nitride DBR. These DBRs were fabricated as NST microelectronics, and um, you can see, you can see somebody. And they can now be fabricated with uh, excellent repeatability and in volume. Um, the laser itself showed good um, good threshold currents, good side mode suppression ratios and output powers. Um, and the, the hybrid laser will, will, it will have a slightly, slightly poor uh, slope efficiency compared with monolithic laser, but the, um, the, it, it gives the, the extra components available will, will compensate. And for instance, here we're using the, the low thermoptic coefficient of silicon nitride, which is about a factor, a rough, I think factor of five less than indium phosphide, which we can use to basically lock that wavelength of the laser. And here is the experimental results as we change the um, as we change the ambient temperature of the hybrid laser, the, the wavelength shows a, a, a minimal drift. So it's many times better than the 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 um, the the DFP laser and the, the five nanometer or so tuning you expect over, over this range. Um, so this is an important step towards realizing WDM in the data center and helping enable these um, this aggregate, these, these switching, these wavelength switching concepts. Um, the, the hybrid laser family or family devices is rapidly expanding. So here's a result from John Bauer's group where they realize a very, very narrow line with the laser. So they're working with, uh, he works with the um, Lionix low loss silicon nitride platform, which is a 50 nanometer thick, um, two micron wide uh, silicon nitride. So it's very, very, uh, very, well, very specialized, very, um, very powerful platform. Um, that has some of the record low losses for the, for in integrated optics. And the key task here was to realize a very narrow line width um, reflection from the DBR, which they use the um, this post technique is how to get it, how to describe it. Um, and this gets to some fantastic numbers in terms of line width, which is important for applications both in uh, LiDAR and in coherent communications. There's more and more of these hybrid lasers starting to appear. Um, for instance, Lionix have, um, have a very nice package solution for single wavelength and tunable lasers. Lionix packaging is obviously a key step in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the realization of useful devices. And again, as I've, and there's a, an increasing trend to move away from these gold box components. Um, and so here we see a um, the micro optical micro optical bench approach, the big pioneered by um, by Blocks Europe and Peter O'Brien and Pixap and others, which um, consists of a um, laser on some mount coupled by a prism down to a grating coupler. Um, and here we see a, a device that's been assembled and packaged by the Pixap pilot line, led by Peter O'Brien. Uh, the top right here, we see the uh, laser on its micro optical bench with various silicon components and similar um, um, or silicon components below and drivers uh, and so on as required. Um, and the, the Pixar pilot line um, is doing some very important, very important work on prototyping services for um, for packaging for for for, 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 um, 
for, 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 for telecommunications and our devices. And in particular, they are developing a, a range of standardized packaging processes um, and by using standardization and toolkits and similar, um, it will drive down, it will basically facilitate better access and reduce packaging costs um, for, for integrated photonics. Uh, you'll find more information on our website. Um, in terms of um, in terms of long term, well, the perhaps the one of the ultimate techniques for um, for, for scalable integration is the technique known as micro transfer printing, which was uh, developed initially developed by the Tyndall National Institute and Seagate, um, um, which basically consists of using a um, transferring. Um, Dies from one one wafer to another, um, in this case, which basically consists of using a stamp to pick up um, pick up devices off their native native substrate, um, uh, and then bring it across to a basically your whatever substrate require, uh, and in which case the um, these transferred dies are bonded to the to the second substrate uh, using van der Waals forces. This is a potentially Arguably, one of the best approaches out there, it would make the optimum use of tree five material it is a very scalable process for, let's say, something like chip, -chip integration will bond one device at a time. Transfer printing up, it has a potential to bond tens or hundreds of devices. Um, and this gives a very scalable, very, um, very scalable um, um, technique. And the alignment accuracy can be very good with optimization. There is some specialized um, the, the optim optimization of the fabrication process required. And this is the work between Brian Corbett of Tyndall, Tyndall National Institute, and Hunter Rolkins and his group at Ghent. Um, there is preparation needs to be done on the silicon so on the silicon side to create recesses, um, and then on the tree five side. In this case, you're, you're transferring a laser across. That the um, the laser in question needs to be undercut in such a way that the stamp can snap it off, and then bring it across. The stamp can pick up the 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 laser in question, detach it from its own substrate by breaking these little tethers here on the side, uh, and um, then transfer across by the silicon. So this is um, what well, needs careful optimization of, of of the fabrication process, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and here we see some recent results on that process. Here we see a um, tree fiber laser bonded to a silicon um, um, silicon chip, and on that, and after bonding, uh, the we we put down a um, a polymer waveguide to connect the laser to the, um, to the silicon pick. Uh, and here we see some of the, the results of that of that of that laser. So we're using the SUA polymer to couple. Um, one to one, one to the other, um, and this is a um, potentially a very powerful approach for the integration of of tree fives onto silicon. We're just coming to the end of that this section now. So um, there's we're we're seeing a ever increasing use of optical interconnects in the in in data centers, and um, basically some in recent years we've had been having. The transceiver has been connected to the edge of the boards, and now there's an increasing penetration and movement to the realization of midboard transceiver, uh, transceivers to get the optical link as close as possible to the to, well, to the source of data, which minimizes um, losses and, and uh, inefficiencies on the electric traces themselves. Now we're increasing, and we can expect to see well, we can expect to see this process increase, and this these sort of optical cards multiplying. As we um, uh, as to enable these new data center architectures, um, so um, again, and I suppose probably one of the key messages I like to make is that basically, in order to facilitate this this, this distributed our um, distributed uh, server architecture, we basically we're going to need ten times or more optics than we have now, and of course we need to these these. These devices need to be provided without without much increase in cost or power consumption, which sets a huge opportunity and a huge challenge for the field. Um, but the payoff is actually we, we actually this approach promises to give basically 
reduction, globally significant reductions in power in, in power consumption. Um, while at the same time we can expect the usual massive increase in demand for um, for, uh, for, day, for 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 bandwidth. Okay, let me move on to the second half of the talk. I'm probably running a little bit behind schedule, so I'll, I'll speed up slightly. So, um, tonic sensors are are ideal for for for, um, for process monitoring and environmental monitoring. There are a few reasons for that. They are natural to they can evaluate the sample in in situ and get direct information on the molecular makeup. Um, and there's no need for chemical prep. Most most techniques will work without chemical preparation of the sample, which means no consumables, no time wasted, uh, and the sensors themselves can be highly stable and run with minimum calibration. Both fields, both just about to break up to two about the number of subfields, but say the process analytic technology field and the environmental monitoring field are both growing at quite at respectable at, at high rates. Um, and indeed, the use of these optical sensors underpins growth in many other sectors, such as quality control in production. And equally, which the new one that appeared that, that's appearing is both proving that factories and various systems are indeed compliant with regulations and proving that a system is not pollution, polluting and so on is, um, is, a key, is, a, is, a, is, a, is now a key concern in many areas. <clears throat> The sensors work in the most of the, the, the infrared is one of the key uh, key interest key key, ray, key wavelengths of interest, which is in the invisible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and typically we're uh, well, uh, covering the wavelength range from about two point five to microns to sixteen hundred microns, or sorry, sixteen microns, um, and you can break it up into a. But, but, Break up further into the near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared. Um, the near infrared, I say, the fun, most of the fundamental vibrations are in the mid infrared, uh, and in near infrared, we see overtones of these and other absorption bands. Um, whereas in the far, in, far infrared, it's more um, molecular rotations are the um, responsible for the absorption in question. Um, so here we see what here we see a little schematic of our one of our little um, um, diatomic gas or whatever, it, whatever we're targeting in. There'll be a certain number of fundamental absorption bands, uh, which we can be probed in the mid infrared. This is closely connected to Raman spectroscopy. In Raman spectroscopy, you use the same energy levels. Uh, it's just excited or just basically scattering light from a pump into a. Um, um, anyway, uh, scattered off a, a, a pump wavelength. Uh, um, in the near infrared, then we can catch overtones and other absorption bands of these fundamental uh, other absorption bands. In general, the near infrared can be quite promising, promising regime to work in, but it tends to be complex. So the spectra is um, well, analyzing that spectra it tends to be difficult, and the absorption absorption features tend to be very broad. Whereas in the mid infrared, you get very discrete, isolated lines um, that, that allow the um, allow the compound of interest to be fingerprinted. Uh, and here we see a little schematic, which comes from the, the NanoPlus uh, website. Uh, here we see the absorption lines of a, a range of important gases. Uh, if you're zooming close enough, you will see that each one of these is very much a discrete line. Um, and the signature of each one, each line can be very carefully identified and is normally unique, or at least relatively really unique compared to other compounds, which allows them to be distinguished from one to another. <coughs> um, whereas, let's say in the mid infrared, all these have, in the near infrared, these have blurred into one another, uh, making your life, life far more complex. So, um, this is. A natural for gas sensing, so environmental monitoring, um, will be the, the the system you build will be looking for each of the absorption lines uh, and are targeting specific lines to tell if a specific gas is present or not. In terms of process analytic technologies, um, again, we're looking for the, the fingerprints of the key, um, the key the key compounds of interest, which can range from pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical ingredients to dyes, um, the packaging elements, and so on. Um, and this has a number of key benefits. 
um, the better, better quality control in a nutshell uh, and reducing testing time. And a key bit and a key push is moving from offline measurements. So very um, many cases, the sample is taken from the production facility, sent to laboratory for analysis, which is not bad, but obviously it's slow, but the field is increasingly moving to bringing the optical sensor into the factory next to the line. So at least you can take your sample, get it, get it tested within minutes, and further moving to actually where the, um, where the optical sensor is built into the, into the production process itself, giving you real-time data on, what, on what's happening. Um, and one of the advantages here is moving away from batch production, which is kind of, anyway, say in, in terms of pharmaceuticals, where batch production is you, you create a, a batch or part of your chemical of interest, um, which involves large, large quantities, uh, whereas by moving to continuous produ production, you can scale your process more effectively, and the amount of material you're dealing with at any one time uh, can be quite a bit less. And that has a, a number of uh, a number of um, gains to be made in terms of efficiency, and similar. The let's say the, the one of the established techniques is what's known as Fourier transform infrared. Uh, in this case, we have a Michelson interferometer and so a broad and, and source from, uh, and light from a broadband light source such as silicon carbide, which when heated up gives a, a broadband mid infrared emission. The one mirror is then scanned giving rise to an interferogram, which you get for your transform to get your spectrum. Um, here we see some examples for wine down on the bottom left. Um, one of the popular approaches is to have the sample interact with an ATR crystal, and the angle of the incident radiation is such that light zigzags through the crystal and interacts with the sample by the evanescent wave. And clearly, depending on the number of bounces, you have different um, sensitivities and similar. Now, obviously, once you mentioned the word Michelson, you can see these are not um, these are not robust devices. They're they're ideal for lab use, but they're perhaps could you, but they're they're certainly not portable and, and certainly difficult to use in the field. Uh, and so that's where uh, techniques such as laser absorption spectroscopy tend to be more preferable. So in this case here, you have a laser uh, a, la a laser. As you tune, say maybe current or temperature, you can sweep its wavelength across the absorption line of your gas of interest. So you get a little dip in the measured output on the photodiode. Um, from this, you um, can detect the presence of your compound of interest, whether it's gas, material, or void, or whatever the case may be. A drawback for particularly for gases is long path lengths tend to be needed, needed off many meters. And there's various multi-pass cell configurations and similar are used. Um, this is this makes this, this affects the compactness and robustness of the device um, and increases the cost, of course. Nonetheless, it is one of the gold standards, and many of the environmental monitoring stations out there will um, will 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 use techniques of this style. <clears throat> A disadvantage is. I say particularly the, I say some numbers for Ireland. So basically, there's about a hundred of such of these monitor state monitoring stations across Ireland. And if you think about the coverage, that spatial co coverage is is not great, basically, especially when you can expect pollutants to to vary over the 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 hundred meter range, uh, or depending on which way the wind is blowing and so on. So a key challenge for, for, for the field is to increase the, the or reduce costs and increase the numbers of these components. Uh, of these sensing systems to give better, you know, get a, get a better spatial coverage of um, of um, what pollution in in, in where we might be. <coughs> um, the quantum cascade laser is one of the key enablers for laser absorption spectroscopy. Um, it was a major big breakthrough, um, which involves the electron. Um, moving through a material, uh, basically a super lattice of of, of layers. Uh, and the photon is emitted um, as the electron makes a, an inter, inter band uh, transmission, uh, transition and then it cascades through the structure, hence the name. Um, this gives a, a very high power spectral density, much higher than, say, the Globar, that tungsten carbide, or that carbon, silicon carbide source mentioned previously. And this is very important for um, techniques such as laser, 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 um, laser absorption spectroscopy and so on. 
Um, the power output and tunability range has been, or has been dramatically improving and is ever getting better. And there's a wide range of very good devices out there in the market, which, um, which facilitate um, many of these measurements. The drawback of the quantum cascade laser is it is a high power consumption device, needs lots of cooling, um, uh, which triggered the development of the interband cascade laser, which uses a slightly different transition. Again, similarly, uh, the, the electron cascades are moved through a cas cascades through a super lattice. The power consumption is much, much lower. Um, threshold currents of 100 milliamps or so are common. Um, and uh, fabrication, the um, market has a wide range of very good fabrication um, processes available. The emission tends to be a shorter wavelength than the QCLs in that three to five micron range or so, uh, overlapping slightly with the QCL. Um, but the general, I think there's some competition between two fields. But the general trend is if you can use an ICL, you, you use an ICL because the, um, the, the, the power consumption is, is lower. Um, but in a nutshell, the availability of these, these brands of lasers has, is, is triggering a range of new spectroscopy techniques, um, new absorption, particularly the laser absorption spectroscopy and similar, um, as the sensitivities are far better than uh, using, say, the, the globe bar or Fourier transform um, and Fourier transform techniques. Uh, a drawback, a, 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 a bottleneck that the field has encountered is basically there, there is no economy of scale, or at least there isn't, an, a, there isn't the same economy of scale for ICLs and QCLs that there is for diode lasers. If you think about telecommunications, pretty much everybody operates at either 13, 10 nanometers or 15, 15 nanometers. That enables basically to be one, I, so each one of those laid basically it is possible for us um, to be, or basically the epitaxy challenges are much less. Whereas in the case of an ICL or QCL, it is pretty much the case of for each gas of interest, you need to do a custom epitaxy run for that. And the wavelength ranges required are massive. I mentioned, as I mentioned, 2.5 to uh, the 16 microns. It creates huge, um, huge different challenges on the material growth size relative to telecommunications. Um, and this creates something of a uh, of chicken and egg scenario for uh, ICL and QCL um, uh, use. If there was if there was if there was a larger volume needed, the cost would come down. However, for each one of those, uh, each 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 wavelength range is is very much its own um, its own structure, and it's hard to reach that economy economy of scale. Um, however, as as the demand for optical sensors grows, we can expect um, or the basically number of lasers to uh, require to grow, which will give the grower, which will give the manufacturers some hope of reaching those economies of scale and bringing those prices down. Um, and so I'd like to mention a few specific uh, uh, new types of spectroscopy. Um, so photoacoustic spectroscopy is a um, interest, important technique um, which is basically, it's an indirect detection. What we have is as laser radiation is absorbed by the gas, uh, the molecules are excited. And as they de-excite, they, de they release their, the absorbed energy as heat. And that heating released, really causes an expansion and contraction of the, of the gas, which can drive to an acoustic wave. Um, and here we see the implementation. The, the laser is modulated in some fashion, so we have a time varying Optic, excit optic excitation, which creates a time varying uh, absorption and a creation of this acoustic wave. And then it is this intriguing technique of basically you use a microphone to listen for this acoustic wave. So and, uh, you can imagine yourself listening for light, which is a interesting little concept. And indeed it was discovered by Alexander Graham Bell quite some time ago. And it's um, been, 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 been widely used over the past um, 20, 30 years um, for, for, for spectroscopy. Uh, a couple of important points is it is it's a background free technique. So let's say if you're doing laser absorption spectroscopy, you have a high signal and as your light is absorbed, you have a small reduction in signal uh, against your strong background. For acoustic spectroscopy, the opposite. If there's no absorption, you have zero signal so you're seeing a, uh, a signal against a, a very low background, which is some advantages. And equally, the, um, 
you can do without your photodiode entirely, which uh, is um, a, a no small advantage. There's now, in recent, in recent years, there's been some sort of work done on miniaturizing photoacoustic spectroscopy, and in particular, the group of Sergio Nicoletti at CEA, CEA Letti have been using silicon fabrication techniques to realize miniaturized um, uh, photoacoustic cells. Um, and the, well, the one of the starting techniques is, or one of the techniques is, one of their techniques is to use um, pattern silicon wafers, bond, to, bond them together, create the, the resonator. Uh, here we see um, this schematic. This is schematic of the channels that are cut into the um, cut into the silicon. Um, we then one arm is illuminated uh, by the laser in question, which excites the gas and creates the acoustic wave, which propagates across the um, the, 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 the the resonator. And then we can see on the this this image here, we can see the two two microphones bonded to the silicon. To detect the, um, the the acoustic wave. Um, getting, this is a very compared to if you compare the size of this to under the Fourier transform interferometer or indeed the traditional laser absorption spectroscopy, we're seeing huge um, or huge advantages, robustness and compactness, and we're getting and the the detection levels uh, are, are quite respectable. And there's further movements in, there. And the, in further, further later generations. They're using a, a pizza resistive gauge instead of a microphone to, uh, to drive down costs further. Um, Frank Tell and Vincenzo Spagnolo are pioneering it, uh, are, are developing a technique known as quartz enhanced photoacoustic spectroscopy. So, again, it starts off from the same point. Uh, we have a time varying, a time varying uh, a modulated laser exciting the gas generating the acoustic wave. Um, the laser is focused in between the prongs of a quartz tuning fork. In their initial first experiments, we're using the quartz, quartz fork from a, from a watch. Um, and as the acoustic wave, it excites a piezoelectric, a piezoelectrically active mode of the tuning fork. Um, and you measure the voltage to, um, to, 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 to read up the signal. Um, this technique has a couple of important advantages that um, the, the, it's very immune to external noise because if there's an external acoustic wave, it basically bends, the, it'll tend to bend the forks in the same direction and, do, and does not excite a pure electric active mode. Uh, and it's only the absorption that occurs in between the two prongs, which you can probably see here schematically on the right here, that, um, that would excite the, or that would generate the voltage. And so a technique here, we can see two, two um, um, uh, tubes around the system to help um, to create an acoustic resonator to help to, to, to maximize the effect. Um, so the laser light is focused through the tubes in between the two forks uh, to accept our gas in, to be the gas in question. Um, this is very much a hyperspectral technique. Depending on which laser you use, you can basically look for any gas in question. The actual hardware of the sensor is identical, or almost identical. Uh, and there, um, there's new techniques um, being employed where you have two lasers and you're simultaneously looking for two gases um, and looking for it by exciting different modes of the tuning fork. Um, pretty much all the all the key all the key pollutants. Many of the key blue pollutants can be uh, detected using this technique at a very um, at, with very high precision into the parts per billion in many cases. With this one here, press of six being a record, to my being one of the records to my knowledge. And indeed, their, um, Vincenzo Spignolo and his lab have a collaboration with Corla, Tor Labs that are seeing these sensors now being um, being, being sold commercially uh, and are now available on the Tor Labs website. Uh, which is an interesting um, development. <clears throat> now, let me return to the um, to the photonic to the photonic integrated circuit and the group of Gore and Masolovich at Southampton have been doing quite a lot of work, uh, a lot of good work on photonic integrated circuits in the mid infrared range. Um, so, silicon itself is a is transparent up to a wavelength of about, about, about one micron. However, silica and that's one of our materials we wide, widely used in silicon photonics is not transparent above 3.5 microns. 
Uh, so Goran and his team are developing suspended um, silicon waveguards of this style to enable um, to, to enable low loss uh, photon integrated circuits. Uh, and then for longer wavelengths, they're employing germanium, um, which we can see here, and that's one of their recent results where they detect um, a uh, albumin um, using um, basically waveguide uh, waveguide based absorption spectroscopy which they couple light into the waveguide, pass the uh, substance of interest on top of the waveguide. Um, and again, it's a very, potentially very attractive way of realizing compact, uh, moderately inexpensive, at least the silicon chip itself is, is, is inexpensive uh, means of, um, of, uh, of um, made for, for made for techniques for made in red spectroscopy. Um, I think this will just finish up here with some work from IBM who are trying to take advantage of the fact that some gases have absorption lines in the near infrared, so methane, which um, uh, is interest both in the oil and gas interest industry and as a, um, and as a greenhouse gas. Um, so they use a, um, um, again, a waveguide absorption spectroscopy to detect uh, the absorption lines of, of, of um, the absorption of the, the, the methane lines uh, and again, they're moving towards a compact, robust, uh, low-cost gas sensors that can be widely, widely divided, deployed with good, to, to good coverage of, um, of whatever the factory oil field or whatever it is the, 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 the place in question. So, uh, and so the last point I'd like to make is in, what, what a key advantage of optical sensors is that there's very little calibration required. This means that the, 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 the sensor is both very stable and sensitive. Um, and um, this means that the, the data produced is of very high quality. And there's a very robust certification process that all, all sensors need to go through. Um, and a, this, this, the, the techniques based on photonics uh, um, are fully compatible with this certification process which means that the data they produce are fully actionable. Ultimately, that the, the data can be stand, single standard in court. So again, if you want to prove that a polluter is indeed polluting, um, the, 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 the data produ ultimately data produced by an optical sensor will, um, will, will, it will be a satisfactory proof. Whereas many of the other sensors out there, they, they, if the calibration, I mean, obviously, if it came to a cup in course, obviously your polluter is going to say that you're, sensor is not calibrated properly, and you need to, be able to produce a documentation to say that that is indeed the case. Uh, and equally, the, the factories themselves will wish to prove that they are not polluting. Uh, and so the, there's a, this is a, uh, a new aspect or new twist to this field where the, um, the quality of the data produced must be uh, of the highest quality, highest standard possible. Similarly, there'll be similar arguments holding for process monitoring for quality control uh, and everything and where quality control is key. Again, one of the key challenges for this field is the cost of the components. Um, and we are, I think the, the as, as these new sensors uh, are being, are coming, are, are coming out and being deployed, I will start to create these economies of scale that will allow the cost to be driven down um, and, and this issue cleared. So uh, let me conclude with this slide. Um, so data communications, quantum integration is a very well-established technology. It has shown huge growth over, um, over the last two decades or more, uh, and there's no sign of this growth stopping. And indeed we're seeing, especially this, this need for disaggregated servers, that there is a huge demand for more advanced devices, more advanced systems, which will enable, which will start to have huge impacts on, the, uh, on, on data centers and how they operate. Um, in spectroscopy, uh, photonic integration and silicon fabrication is relatively new, which is creating many new opportunity areas and application areas. Um, and many of us are trying to leverage the techniques of, um, that were developed in data communications to drive down the costs of components. Uh, and indeed, there's a potential synergy between these two fields where they'll draw off one another and help uh, or uh, feed into one another and help realize the economies of scale. That will drive down costs um, and um, and and see a, a much wider deployment of optical sensors in a whole range of new and novel scenarios. 
uh, with that, I'll finish up, and uh, I've, as I and I've acknowledged the funding bodies here for the for our own results that I've included in this uh, in this presentation. So thank you very much, and back to you, Akil. So I suppose um, I suppose you could, be, you could be aware of if you're if you're working in a field of photonic integration and so on, you will have the the there's a big difference between data communications and the style of work in data communications as in and, and in optical niches. Data communications is, is I mean the, the the big industry players are having an increasing role there, um, which has has an effect on how the field operates and how how it progresses. Optical sensing is full of niches. Um, so again, getting getting this huge economy of scale is really difficult, but that entry point is easier. Um, so yeah, I suppose maybe I'll just, I think that's a point you should be aware of as you plan your career. Um, and, um, I suppose especially comes to, let's say commercial exploitation and so on and, and your own, in, own interest in that regard. Uh, be aware of the challenges and the size of the, the companies involved. Um, kind of slightly more general terms, I would kind of let's say, yeah, my, my, if you're if you're would encourage people in general to try and get a interaction with with let's say in all aspects of the process, or at least some aspect, be familiar with design, fabrication, characterization, and so on. Try and get a little of experience in all three of those fields. Obviously, that's most applied to um, to photonic integration, but um, there'll be similar it'll, there'll be similar. Um, It'll hold in similar in, in there'll be similar um, splits in different fields, and I would encourage you not to not to focus entirely in one, and at least get some get some get some flavour, at least figure out how the other aspects of your of your field works. Um, I suppose in general, slightly more vague or slightly more different degree advice is let's say as you're finishing a PhD or first postdoc, try and find a, a postdoc next postdoc topic is being connected but slightly different to your first one, so you're broadening out your expertise. It is very easy to fall into the trap of doing a postdoc project that's exactly the same as your PhD. Um, it's well, it's, it's fine to a degree, but branching out and building that 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 that, 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 um, that set of skills is important. And indeed, let's say in my own group, I love getting in people who are completely different to what we do because they they cross pollinate and so on, um, and, and so on. So it's a rare, it's rarely the lack of expertise is rarely a problem. <laughs> 